I am a director of In Jesus Name, Shattering the Silence of St. Anne's Residential School. I'm also one of the producers and the editor of the film. And this is? I'm uh, Louis Napisweet. I come from uh, Port Albany, Ontario. Actually, I was born in Mosini, but I went to a residential school in Port Albany. That's where this is all about. So. I'm glad to be here. So around the start of the century, I had been commissioned by a nonprofit organization to write a social activism curriculum for grade six students and had autonomy the whole way through mm -hmm. as far as who I interviewed, um, how the, the uh, chapters were written, and so on. Um, but then when it came to the chapter on Indigenous issues, and I always bounced my ideas to the founders anyways, mm -hmm. said, just let them know what I was going to be writing about. And I let them know that I was going to write age-appropriate material on residential schools. And at that point, they came back and they said, you can't do that. That if you write about residential schools, the government will find and do everything possible to make sure that the publication doesn't get out. So at that point, I handed the project back to them and I said, you write the chapter, I'm not writing it then. And um, so I continued on throughout the years uh, in my undergrad and my graduate studies to re uh, research uh, what had happened at the residential schools. And in the fall of 2014, I came as across a small online article uh, with Edmund Matadawaban, who is the co-producer on this film, speaking about um, horrific abuse of children at St. Anne's Residential School, including the use of a tool of torture on the children. So um, I wrote up a proposal and I, I reached out to Edmund, sent him that proposal, we talked and we just hit it off right away. And we both agree and all the survivors in the film agree that everybody in Canada and around the world needs to know what happened to the Indigenous children at this school. Um, and St. Anne serves as a microcosm for other schools all across the, the country. So it's a really important, I can't say story, it's not one story, it's a multitude of uh, many stories. And issues. And issues. And um, so this film is like a small representation of what the children went through there. And our hope, we have many hopes, but we really want to give people a little nudge and say, I've begun to do my research and I'm really appalled at what happened and other people need to take it forward too and continue to research and continue to nudge and continue to contact our government and the Catholic Diocese about what happened at that school because a lot of it still remains very, very oh, hidden. He was recommended to me um, by a friend that we have in common who doesn't want to be named. Uh, so it took me a while to track him down. He's a bit of a wanderer. <laughs> and sometimes he has a phone and sometimes he doesn't. And eventually I got him on the phone and we hit it off right away as well. And uh, I let him know what the project was about and he's like, yes. We need to tell these stories, and he's he's in with both feet. He agrees. These stories need to be told. I'm very happy about it, mm -hmm. so that people will know across Canada, mm -hmm. all the residential schools. So it's all different, but the one I went with was kind of it was already on, uh, but uh, to go there. But the thing is to learn. It was not to learn, but uh, we had the views, work, and all that. Even. Uh, it passed a generation, and when I went to school there, I was about close to five years old. I was born in 1946, and I was registered to go to school at the St. Anne's School in 1950. And I was born in 19, in 19, my birthday was November 1951, that's where I started, when I was not quite five. And the other thing I was so happy about to know that I think it passed a generation like that, and I know my father even went to residential school. That residential school was built in the 1920s. So 
My father went and I went, and the suffering is still coming on. But I'm glad people will know. At least my father didn't know about this, but I'll pass it on. Thank you so, so much yeah. for sharing. Yeah. I just have one thing to add. Um, we, I've interviewed many, many people over the course of the two years or, and um, ran across a number of youth, especially who were in their early to mid-20s, mm -hmm. who still didn't have any idea that we had residential schools in Canada. Oh. Still had no um, idea that this abuse occurred in Canada. So this is why this film is really, really important as an educational tool. Mm -hmm. Because um, entire groups or, or demographics are missing this knowledge in Canada, and it needs to get out there. Um, so I think that's a really important piece with respect to this film. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs>I mean, I guess it, in some ways it all began at the uh, University Theatre on May 28th, 1977, when I saw Star Wars for the first time. It was the first movie I'd ever seen in a movie theatre. And it was the, that's the moment I fell in love for the first time. And I haven't been out of love with movies ever, ever since. So, I mean, I guess the, that's the long journey. And I think for me it was just a matter of... Um, you know, movies were my passion. Storytelling was really my passion, and I just wanted to be involved in that, however that looked. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I've just been very open to a variety of different roles and opportunities in a variety of different businesses or or um, you know or, or areas. Um, just because for me, if they were connected to film, that was ultimately important. And I think as I've as the years have gone on. Um, Certainly the ideas of storytelling and particularly indigenous storytelling has been really central to, to what I'm trying to do and to create space uh, for indigenous storytellers to tell their stories because I think that's so vital for our communities to get back to a healthy place and, and to reclaim um, so much of our culture that's been forcibly removed. So I think uh, all of that has really now been in, in service to that. And I think there's we've seen a huge growth in the appetite for stories from all sorts of different places. And I think that's really rather reflective of just the communities we live in, which are really diverse and full of people from all places from all over the world. And the stories they tell and the stories they're interested in are gonna be very different than the stories a place like Toronto or Canada was interested in even 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, I think the biggest barriers have just been made, creating that space and getting that, the listening, and to counteract um, you know, I think for for indigenous peoples in Turtle Island, a, enormous amount of effort has to go into simply counteracting falsehoods and, and misrepresentations that have been going on for so long and are quite embedded in the culture. Mm -hmm. So I think that is an ongoing daily, daily struggle, not just for me, but I think for all people doing <clears throat> similar work is just trying to counterbalance the false narratives that have been in place for so many years. Uh, I mean, if there was, if there was one thing, mm -hmm. I guess it would be to separate commerce from art because I think when we've applied commercial principles to art and movies are art they're I think first and foremost I think they've become a commercial enterprise and when we place commerce on it suddenly a whole bunch of other assumptions arise that actually limit the opportunities for diverse voices because suddenly you think well this isn't going to sell or I need this to sell. we've always heard you can't you know, you can't have, say, an Asian uh, movie star because it won't somehow sell. Sell is the problem. It's not, it, the talent and the stories have never been the issue. It's that we conflate success with this commercial success. And A, the reality is I think that's all wrong. So in other words, I think you could have a huge blockbuster with whoever, I, I, any number of people. It, has, it, it doesn't matter. That's a falsehood. Um, but I think if we were actually able even to st strip those commercial assumptions out, it would be quite freeing. Even though there's always been barriers for marginalized people to gain access in any art mediums, I think film is particularly hard because they demand you, this sort of monetary um, success at a certain level in the industry, and I think that creates these 
reinforces false barriers that are already there. And I think that is one of the real huge impediments. I mean, the other thing I would do is change entirely the people who get to green light movies and who get to say yes to projects. Because mm -hmm. again, I think those positions have traditionally been held by a very limited few people and not at all diverse people. And I think when you, it's one thing to have diversity and inclusion in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. That's very important. But to really get, to eliminate the need for diversity mm -hmm. is to have it at that, those levels too. Because mm -hmm. I think that sorts out all sorts of things. I mean, I think the, the, the direction is certainly an interesting one. I think there's, of course, all sorts of challenges in terms of how policy like that or, or a position paper like that actually gets implemented or turned into um, public policy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I think there's still lots of that. I think, though, um, it certainly is saying all the right things and mm -hmm. certainly acknowledging that there has been an inequality in terms of representation and access for marginalized people in Canada historically, and that this has to be recti rectified. And I think of particular gratification is that there seems to be an increasing understanding that Indigenous artists, Indigenous storytelling is really crucial on the Turtle Island, and not just for us, but for everyone who lives here to actually gain a true understanding of this place mm -hmm. is, to, is to forefront Indigenous voices. So I think I think there's still lots of questions to be asked, and we'll see how it goes, but I think it's definitely, it points in a favorable direction, that I'll say that. First mentor is the guy who hired me at TIFF, who is, who's no longer there, Noah Cowan. He now runs the San Francisco Film Society. He's hired me for every job I've ever done at TIFF. He's a, he's a dear friend, and he's, he, every time he's hired me, he took a chance, because I didn't have... I, did, I had some things, but not other things, you know what I mean? And he, he chose... So for sure, and he taught me really everything I know about um, a certain side of the movie business. Uh, he was a hugely instrumental uh, in that. That was that's for sure one. And then the other one is someone I guess I would say Alan Issa Bomson, who's a filmmaker, and who I've known for a very long time now, and who's really as much responsible as Star Wars for me being here with you today. You know, she's yeah. she's been making films about indigenous peoples in Canada for 50 years. She's just made her 50th film. She's now 85 years old. Oh, wow. I've known her since 1995. And she absolutely changed my life. She changed my understanding of what movies could be, the potential of movies, why it's important that marginalized people get to make them and get mm -hmm. to use their voice in that way. Mm -hmm. um, she, she told me that there could be indigenous cinema. And before her, I didn't realize that that could even be a thing um, so I always say she is the mother or grandmother she's my I guess my grandmother uh, and she's the grandmother of all indigenous cinema mm -hmm. and so f her I guess would be the other one I think sh she would probably bristle to say she isn't my mentor but I I look to her often and yeah so I said those two have been in terms of the film side just hugely instrumental in in supporting me and inspiring me and driving me to to succeed but make to make change uh, as you go awesome thank you so very thank much. you so much and congratulations again on the oh. activist award thank you miigwech <laughs> It's really amazing. It's a beautiful feeling. I mean, I've known Jesse for more than 20 years, watched his work. Um, he's thought of me as a bit of a mentor. I was already on the scene for a while when he was starting out. But I'm really, it, it makes me proud. He's done, a, you know, so many wonderful things. Um, and this festival, too, watching people who had their first film or short here 17 years ago, watching them grow into really amazing filmmakers and storytellers, um, seeing them get work and able to sustain themselves from this industry, which is a difficult thing to do, and the opportunities that we've given so many people. You know, when we first started the festival, couldn't find people of color who had, you know, run a film festival before, who knew. So we've trained and we've partnered with a lot of schools where they've also had us, you know, bring a lot of their people in to intern with us. I think it makes people feel. Um, appreciated and and proud and understood when they can see faces like themselves within an organization that they work and we're we're right up and down the board so we have diversity not only in front of the cameras and behind the cameras but our board of directors 
right down to the volunteers, the interns, uh, staff that work there. So it's an important message for us. You know, it's so hard. This, it's, it's multifaceted. There's not one thing. Um, it depends who I'm thinking of. A lot of young filmmakers, I would love them to think more about what is their message? What is it they want to impact the audience with? Because we've never had more content in the world. I mean, we're, we're infiltrated with content. It doesn't mean the content's good, but there's a lot of it. Um, I'm not always sure that filmmakers are taking the time to think, who is my audience and, 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 and what is the universal message I really want to get across? Because those themes never change. I had the pleasure of knowing this man that we're going to be honoring today, Jesse Wente, for over 20 years. He was one of the first programmers, actually, here at Real World Film Festival way back in the old days of 2001. I count him as one of a small group of diverse individuals who have dedicated their lives in Toronto to making positive change in his community and the communities around him. Jesse is Ojibwe. When his, grandpa his grandparents, though, hail from Chicago and the Serpent River First Nation in Ontario, that his mother was born in Toronto, and he was born in Toronto, and this city really means a lot to him. One of the things that Jesse and I share is the experience of being people of color who went to a predominantly white private school. It had its challenges. But you know, there were also some positive things for that, because he and I both talked about the fact that there's a comfort level we have being in every community. At this time, I would like to bring up Jay Cameron, who is the Director of Sales and Marketing for Pierre Laurent Timepieces, since they created the amazing, come on up, Jay. <laughs> the amazing award that Jesse will be receiving today. Beautiful. I couldn't be more proud of you getting this award. No one is more deserving than you to have this. So please join me in welcoming Jesse Quinto. Survivor's film. It was it was called that in an article that was just written. 